Hey, thanks a lot for the invitation. As Ravi said, you know, my, I don't know how much you know about uh, this, the stuff that I'm going to talk, so just feel free to ask any questions that you have. So I'm going to talk about uh, kind of a special properties of curves in K3 surfaces and uh, show that we can actually obtain a hypercolor variety of any dimension as, uh, as a kind of moduli space of a stable vector bundle on curves. Which is uh, which is not really what we expected from curves to just to have such kind of rich geometry behind. It. So to just make it, you know, the whole process a bit more precise, I need to uh, consider some moduli spaces. So let me just consider a start with the moduli space of G, which parameterizes triples x, h, and c, where x and h is a polarized K three surface. And C is a, a smooth curve of genius G in the linear system H. So, so we have a natural projection map that I'm going to denote by phi, uh, phi G. So it's a smooth curve of genius G. That's, that's the G part here. So we have a natural map um, to moduli of smooth curve of genius G. We, we just forget the information of the polarized K3 surface that we have here. So if we want to just do some simple counting, you know, we can just count the dimension of this moduli space of G to be just, you know, we have the choice of the polarized K3 surface, which is 19, plus the choice of the curve C, which is just uh, G. And we know that this dimension is bigger than or equal to the dimension of the moduli space of a smooth curve of genius G, which is 3G minus 3. If and only if um, G is a small than or equal to 11. So we expect that when G is very low, then the map phi G is, is dominant. So it can just cover all curves of that genius. And this expectation is actually proved by Gilberto Lopez and Miranda. They proved that if G is small uh, and G is not equal to 10, then the map phi G is dominant. Uh, but what's happening for a higher genius? So then in a series of work of Mukai and the same work as this work of Silberto Lopez and Miranda, they actually prove that when we go to higher one, uh, we gain actually a birational map on two ECMA. So if G is bigger than or equal to 11 and G is not equal to 12, then the map phi G is birational on two ECMA. Sorry. Actually, I have an idle, idle question. I know G equals 10. Is this magical? I know uh, case is G equals twelve. Some magical case as well. That some yes. like magical. Happens. Yeah. So so yeah. Exactly. For G equal to ten and G equal to twelve, they are exceptional behavior, and neither is dominant nor is generically finite. So so as uh, so the the problem for genius twelve is that you know. Um, you know, the key point is existence of final three folds of genius 12. Because, um, you know, uh, as soon as you have a final three folds of that genius, then, then if you look at, you know, K3 surfaces in that linear system, so you can look at just a pencil of K3 surface in that linear system that intersect in one curve. And so that curve carries at least the one dimensional family of K3 surfaces. Uh, which, which can be embedded into that. That's why it's just destroyed the picture that is by rational and fixed image. So, but uh, so if if we just leave that uh, exceptional behavior, so go for genus eleven or g bigger than or equal to thirteen, then uh, then we can look at the inverse image of the map phi g. So it means that if just we look at any general curve in the image of phi g and try to construct um, uh, a K3 surface, which basically contains uh, our, uh, our uh, curve. So, and this is actually a kind of program which is conjectured by Mukai uh, to find the rational inverse of inverse of YG. Okay, and um, 
so uh, so we want to start with the gen so the program wants to start with a general curve in the image of the map and construct and you know explicitly construct uh, the k3 surface i put the k3 surface as we know that there exists a unique one for that general one construct the k3 surface x and h and uh, you know, this provides k3 surface which contains our curve c um, so and this program is proved by Moka himself for uh, genius equal to 11 and, uh, and then it has been proved by Arbello, Bruno, and Cernesi when uh, G is equal to um, uh, 1 mod 4. And then in, um, in one of my paper, I've proved that you know, in, in full generality, um, I prove it for any uh, G bigger than or equal to 11 when G is not equal to 12. This program is true. So, the, the idea behind the program is that you start with a general curve in the image of that mass IG and then can look at a kind of a special modular space of vector bundles on the curve, which we call them Brillo at look as on the curve. And we show that if we choose uh, the, you know, you know, the rank and degree of this bundle in a suitable way, then we um, can show that this perimeter locus is a K3 surface and the original K3 surface, which contains our curve, is actually a free Mokai partner of it. That's why we can, we can recover basically the K3 surface out of uh, the information of just the curve. Um, so what I'm going to explain today is just uh, basically a generalization of this idea that not only we can recover hypercalar variety of dimension two out of a curve, we can do it for any dimension and recover these hypercalar varieties. Uh, but you know, after proving that Mukai's conjecture one, one and there's still one important question remains uh, unsolved. And this is that uh, can be characterized all curves on K3 surfaces. Curves uh, in image of this map phi G. So I, I, you know, we are looking for sufficient and necessary conditions for, um, for a curve so that if these conditions are satisfied, then there is a K3 surface uh, such that the curve can be embedded into that. Yeah, of course. Okay. So then can I ask, so, uh, so if I understand this correctly, uh, and I'm extrapolating from what you said that if you have a curve that's on a K3 surface, you can find, you're going to describe a way of realizing in the line bundles of the curve where this K3 is lurking, how to interpret it. And then I was going to guess that it's on a K3 if and only if such a real other type locus, if and only if such a thing exists. And that was your, and that would be a characterization. And then maybe where it's not finite, where it's not one to one uh, in the general, where you said it's only generally by rationals. Presumably it can be multiple in some cases, and that'll mm -hmm. presumably be because there's more than one real other type, whatever this structure is, it has more than one of those. And that's the, is that the, so, or, so does what you do not characterize it already by answering Mukai's conjecture? Uh, so not really, you know, uh, so, so, you know, we want the full characterization. That's the first problem. You know, we don't want to just look at a general point in, in, in image of IG. Uh, you know, we actually know a kind of kind of characterization for very not a petri, uh, you know, curves that if the wall map is not surjective, then the curve lies in a petri or limit of a petri. So we have some sort of characterization for a general one, but we want a behavior that it just works for any point in the image of IG. And the same thing happens here. You know, you know, everything that I'm going to explain here works for K3 surfaces of Picard rank one. That's why, but we, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I will explain that why we hope that this procedure is the right way to completely answer this question. Uh, yeah, and it's not the kind of things that just be valid for a general one. It's the kind of magic things that is true. You know, we hope that to be true for any curve which can be embedded into a K3. And the second thing is that you said line bundles. You know, line bundles are not the correct choice, actually, you know, because um, 
we know that all curves in the image of 5D are Brillouin-Noiter Petri general curves. So the behavior of line bundles on this curve is like a general curve in MG. That's why the idea is we go to high rank vector bundles and see that how is the behavior of these special vector bundles on the curve. Okay, so um, that's the question and I'm, I will come back to that one, but let me just first state the main theorem that I'm going to discuss today. So fix them. Um, um, fix to integer positive integer number um, R and K such that uh, K is smaller than R and they are coprime. Okay, uh, after fixing this pair, then I pick uh, uh, genius G to be large enough. So it's large with respect to the choice of uh, R and K. Okay, then uh, for this uh, choice of R, K and G, we know that there exists a unique S, uh, an integer S in uh, such that satisfy this inequality. We want that K square, uh, 2G minus two, minus two R S uh, to be between minus two and minus two plus two R. Okay, so uh, since you know you look at the multiples of minus two R, you know you can always find such an S uh, which uh, which lies in this interval. You will see in a minute why I'm choosing uh, that integer S to satisfy this condition. Then I want to look at the brim, and then I want to just take a curve, just take any curve C of uh, genius G. Genius G that you uh, you pick here, okay? And then I'm going to look at the brim with a locus on that curve of uh, bundles of rank R and degree K 2G minus two, and uh, which have at least all pass S sections. So let me just uh, write down the precise definition. So it parameterizes rank R semi-stable uh, vector bundles on C. Uh, which have degree of e is um, k 2g minus 2 and have at least the uh, r plus s section. Okay, so we know that the expected dimension of uh, this brillouin locus is is uh, is negative. So we expect that for a general curve this brillouin noetal locus to be empty. So we don't want that, you know, you know, so for a general curve, the claim is that there isn't any such kind of vector bundle on, um, on the curve C. But we will see that when you are on a K-tracer and then that curve lies in a K-tracer phase, then this brillouin noetal locus is actually not, even it's not empty, it's actually a hypercalum but manifold. So the main theorem is the following. So let X and H be a polarized K3 surface. Such that P card of X is just generated by H. And I pick C to be any curve in the linear system H of genius G. So this is the genius G that I start and uh, picked in data star here. Okay, and maybe I emphasize here that C is any curve. You know, it could it could be possibly singular, but uh, you know, the magic thing in the techniques of visual and standard condition that I'm going to use is that we don't really care about uh, you know the support of these bundles. You know, it just can be true for even the singular one. And then there is a morphism psi from the moduli space of a stable object of Mokai uh, no, vector R, K, H, and S. So this is just moduli of D secure semi stable shape of rank uh, R and churn one equal to K, H, and churn two plus churn zero to be equal to S. So it's just a module of Gisiker semi-stable shift on, uh, uh, on X. And uh, 
claim that there is a MAF site from this marginalized space to the very moment of locus C that I've, I've defined here. So let me just define this very moment of locus to be what I've defined. And it just sends a bundle, uh, you know, a sheaf that we, you know, as I, I will explain, any look, any Gieseker semi stable ship in that modularized space because of the condition that we put here is, is locally free. So any bundle it just goes to its restriction to the curve C. Okay. And the claim is that you have a well defined, you gain a well defined morphism by, by defining like that and even more. So I is an, actually an isomorphism. And we know that all of the modular space of a stable shape on a K3 surface is actually a hypercalorie manifold. That's why, as a corollary of this, uh, this one, again, that this dream not a locus is actually a smooth projective hypercalorie manifold. Do you, want to, do, uh, do you want to define what hypercalorie means, or is it something that can be just taken as a black box for the? For, for yeah, the yeah, I do not want. To really, you know, to go to the details of that, you know, and you That's know, the only thing that, you know, the, the only things that you know, probably you should ask yourself about this process. In you know, we want a kind of simplicity form on the tangent space of this brain motor locus. So I, I will, I will explain it. You know, what, what is precisely the magic things that uh, is just really surprising. So, um, and you know. The, you know the, the proof that you know that this map psi is well defined. You know it's not that hard. You know you, you start with a vector bundle. You restrict it to the KRC. So it's it's just a kind of restriction theorem to show that after restriction your bundle remains stable, and the degree is just by some numerical computations. And the number of sections is uh, is just you know the number of global section of E restricted to C is always bigger than or equal to the number of section of E. That's why proving that uh, it's a well defined one is not a very hard one. And um, as I will explain, injectivity is not too hard. But the main part is surjectivity of this morphism psi, which basically says that if you take any arbitrary vector bundle on the curve C, which satisfies some properties, as in this brain nota locus, then there exists a unique vector bundle uh, on, the, uh, on this K3 surface whose restriction gives the, uh, gives the vector bundle on the curve C that you start with that. So the deformation of this bundle on the curve is the same as the deformation on the surface. That's why it's just, um, uh, you you pick up it. Uh, uh, so I think there is a question. So uh, so it 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 is okay. Oh oh yeah. Don't worry about the chat. I'm just uh, this is uh, okay. to warn other people. Okay. Yeah. So so let me just say as a corollary of uh, that tell you uh, that you know. This beam noita locus is slightly smaller than what we originally uh, claimed. So, if you look at any um, any F in that beam noita locus, uh, since it's just image of uh, this map psi, so we can actually show that it is stable. You know, it cannot be strictly semi-stable, <laughs> and. In the definition of brain noita locus, we just fix the degree. But since we know they are all restriction of vector bundles on the K3, we know actually that what is the determinant of this bundle. So the determinant is just product of the canonical bundle. And we also know that the number of section of any bundle in this brain noita locus is precisely R plus S. So R plus S is the maximum number of global section that they could achieve. Okay. That's why now, by, by the fact that this is a stable and they have the maximum number of global section, then you can understand what is the tangent, you know, describe what is the tangent space of this perimeter locus, and then ask that can be described as Q pairing on, on this tangent space and why we have that skew pairing. And unfortunately, we do not know still the answer.
that you know just out of the curve how we can construct that skew page is a very non-linear question you know um it's not it's not of course uh, you know it's true that is there is some plucky friend there because it is isomorphic to the marginalized space of stable shift on a k3 but uh, it's not at all clear from the curve itself that how we can construct that is QP. So, so, so it's a very it's a very strange okay so you can't just translate back right the translation through the k3 it's completely non-transparent what that what the form does yeah okay hmm, that's mysterious yeah. So, so, and it motivates the, you know, the, the, this question that is just coming back to the original uh, goal that we had. So, if we take any curve in the image of uh, that map five D, so any arbitrary curve. Now, up to now, I've just described a general one, which was on a K three of pre rank one. So, just pick an arbitrary curve in the image of five uh, D, any uh, curve uh, on a K three, and take G to be large. So no, just no, this condition that G is large is super important because if G is low, then this perimeter locus, you know, we know example, you know, for instance, when G is small than, I don't know, 33, something like that, there are examples that this perimeter locus is a final threefold. So this hypercalor structure or this non-degenerate form comes up when you go to hygiene somehow, you know, that which is again is very mysterious. So and so pick that genus to be large and then define edge to be just the maximum number of sections that bundle on that curve C could have. So the <coughs> maximum number of sections that bundles uh, you know F to be a rank R a stable bundle on F such that they have canonical determinant. So just put k equal to one in the above equation. So it's just the um, Mokai things. You know, Mokai always look at rank two bundles with canonical determinant. That's why he always just got k3. But as soon as we go to higher rank with two bundles, you, you know, this, this uh, higher dimensional hypercalor comes up. So define as to be the maximum number of sections that they could have. Then we can consider the brain locus of vector bundles on the curves uh, C of rank R with canonical determinant and this maximum number of sections. And the question is that is this a hypercolor variety or not? And and the next problem is, does it give us a full characterization of curves on K2 surfaces or not? So as soon as you have such kind of a special behavior for that perimeter locus, does it just force you that the curve C must have a deformation inside a surface, which is as special as a K3, or it could happen for other curves. So we are more or less in the project, we are more or less uh, close to answering this question for any curve just by generalizing the strategy that I'm going to explain today. So I hope in a very near future, we can, we can answer both these questions. So is there any questions for now? So I'm not sure if you answered this already, but if you take a curve that is not on a K3 surface, what can you say about this? We will know the local, is it, is it empty in that case? So we don't know. The expected dimension is negative. So, and in the examples that we, you know, we know up to now for, you know, like genius thirteen or sixteen, they are, yeah, they are empty. But so in that uh, case, it's always empty if the curve is not on a K three. So, not you know, in just very special curves that we know that they cannot be in the image of ID. So it's just they kind of very you know, a specific example. It's not at all clear that how we can just say that they are completely empty. I'm not quite sure that, I'm not quite sure that, you know, just the fact that um, this spring loiter locus is non-empty gives us a characterization of curves on K3. Mm -hmm. So they could be non-empty, but uh, this, this hypercolor structure is it maybe is a kind of unique behavior for for just care which can be embedded into a K3. So for a general hygienist, 
do, do you know whether this locus is empty for the, the general curve? I, I don't think so. No, we don't know that. You know, all of these problems of higher rank vector bundles are all open. You know, the, we know how is the behavior of line bundles, but even if we, we, then we go to rank two, I think all of these problems are open. And okay, you know, the agent, you know, it's, it's easy always to see that there are some bundles there, but proving emptiness is a kind of tricky thing. <coughs> Okay, so if there is no other question, I'm going to briefly explain the technique that I've used to, uh, to prove that one, which is wall crossing <coughs> with respect to bridge line and stability condition. So maybe it's a bit late to ask that question, but Ravi, do, do I have one hour or one hour and 30 minutes? <laughs> Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's one hour, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's one hour, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I, will, I will skip some parts probably. So, so let me just uh, briefly explain probably you are all familiar with this notion of bridge line stability conditions. So, Actually, I can, safely, I, I can safely bet that uh, it's, a, it's a broad audience, so some will be familiar and certainly some will not be. So, oh, okay. So, so, so I, I will just, just say what, what's, what's the image behind it. Okay. So let X and H be a polarized K-tracer phase. <laughs> so, which means the canonical bundle is trivial and each one of the structure she vanishes. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm always going to denote by dx the bounded drive category of coherent shapes on x, and I will denote by uh, v of e the Mukai vector of e. This is basically churn zero of e and churn one of e, churn zero of e plus churn two of e. So it lies in the lattice of numerical gross in the group of x, which in this uh, case is very simple. It's just the lattice C past neural severe group of X, your X on C. Okay. So, so how how we can define you know classical stability? We are just looking at the bounded drive category of. <coughs> sorry, we are just looking at <coughs> abelian category of coherent sheaves on X and define just an uh, ordering. Uh, for, for these shapes we are we are slope function. So we look at mu h of e to just be h churn one over h two churn zero if churn zero is not equal to zero and uh, otherwise we define it to be plus infinity. Okay and then we say that a sheaf is um, is mu h semi stable If for all non-trivial subsheaf of uh, E, uh, we know that a slope of F <coughs> is a smaller or a smaller than or equal in case of semi-stability than the slope of the quotient E over F. Okay, so this is just a classical slope function that we have for coherent sheaves, and we know that any coherent sheaf satisfy harder than filtration. Uh, so for, for, which means that for any sheaf, there is a filtration to semi-stable factor. And uh, I'm going to denote by uh, mu h plus or minus of e, the maximum and the minimum slope in the filtration uh, for, for any sheaf e. Okay, so this is just a maximum uh, a minimum, um, you know, maximum sub up uh, sub sheaf and the minimum uh, you know the slope of the sub sheaf of maximum slope and uh, minimum co um, minimum slope of the quotient so the idea for constructing bridge line stability condition is that we just change this category in this classical abelian category of coherent sheaves to a new abelian category Okay. 
And then uh, if we want to do that, then we need to also change the slope function to a new slope function to be just compatible with the new abelian category that uh, you can see here. <coughs> so let me just uh, explain what is the new abelian category that you want to consider. So it's just um, for any real number B, we define the abelian category called B of X to be just um, two term complexes such that uh, mu h minus of um, kernel of d is the small than or equal to b. So this is just, again, the slope, minimum slope, sorry, plus maximum slope in the filter, a hard enhancement filtration of kernel of d, this sheaf kernel of d, and mu h minus of co-kernel of d is, uh, is bigger than b. So if you are not familiar with this notion, you, you don't need to just go to the details of that. Just look at that code b as a new abelian category. It's just proved actually by Tumbridge and that this is an actually an uh, abelian subcategory of uh, the drive category of coherent sheaf on x. It's actually part of the bounded T structure. <coughs> So the next step is, um, is we define the slope function as we had for, um, for coherent sheaves. So just uh, for any w bigger than h square, d square over two. So it's just the kind of technicality that why we need w to be large enough. We define the the stability function ZDW from the numerical Boltzmann group of X to complex number, which sends the class of E to uh, minus chain two of E plus W chain three of E. <coughs> minus B chain three of E. Okay. So it's a simple exercise just to show that this imaginary part is actually non-negative. So this is non-negative if your object e is in the new heart that you constructed here, okay? So if you look at any object in that heart, you can see that the image is either in the upper half plane or negative real life. So corresponding to any object in this abelian category, we can have a well-defined notion of face, okay? which just varies between zero and one. Okay. And so we can define that an object E in my category <coughs> is uh, a stable with respect to the choice of beyond W is semi-stable if for all non-trivial sub-object in this uh, you know, this in this abelian subcategory uh, called B of X, we know that uh, face of this sub-object is smaller than face of uh, E or smaller than or equal in case of semi-stability. Okay, so um, that's, uh, <coughs> that's the notion of stability and Tom Bridgman proved that uh, for any W bigger than H uh, square, B square over two, this pair is B, B W, which is just defined as co B, <clears throat> with this stability function, ZBW is a stability condition, is a bridge line stability condition, which I'm not going into the details of that, which means it satisfies a support property and a hard man filtration, so which is important for us. So it is a bridge line stability condition if this pay satisfy hard man uh, property. So it means that for any arbitrary object in your heart, there exists a filtration, a finite filtration to semi-stable objects. Such that if you look at the quotients, EI over 
the quotient is EI over EI minus one, they are all sigma semi-stable and the phases decreases. So phase of E1 over E0 is bigger than phase of E2 over E1 and so on. Okay. You see that um, uh, why it's super, you know, this, you know, it just, this definition is precisely the same as what we had for slope stability, just the same structure basically, but just by generalizing uh, the abelian category that we work with that. But the key point in all of this construction is that now you have two parameters, B and W, corresponding to any choice of B and W. Let me just go to the uh, next page. So you, you have these two parameters, B and W. If you just pick any point above this parabola, you, you gain a kind of uh, stability conditions corresponding to any of it, this point. Okay. But the point is, when you move a lot, you know, uh, above this parabola, then this notion of uh, stability, this sigma b w stability is continuously changing. So it means that for any object e in the x or in your hard copy of uh, yeah, uh, b of x, there exists the um, a wall and chamber decomposition. Uh, decomposition. So I do not want to do the details of that one, but you know, just the picture is like that. <coughs> They're all local finite set of walls, which you can just think of them on, uh, as some line segments here, such that if you move along each of these chambers, the area between these um, uh, these walls, then um, so it's just this is just walls for your fixed object. Yeah, so then sigma b and w stability of E is uh, just unchanged when you move along these chambers. Okay, but when you are on the wall, your object is, is strictly semi stable and it just switches from stability to instability or vice versa. So in one side of the wall, your object, your fixed object is unstable. So although the idea looks, looks uh, very simple, but it's super powerful to just think about, uh, you know, just do while crossing for a specific objects in your bounded drive category, and then geometry and the properties of that bundle shows up when, when you see what are the walls that can happen for your fixed object. Okay. So let me just go to the proof of the theorem uh, uh, that, uh, that I've said. So we want to just, uh, so let me just recall you here that was, uh, what, what was the claim? So we wanted to show that there is a kind of uh, isomorphism between the moduli space of a stable shift on curve to that brain local locus, which we are sending E to E restricted to C, okay? So the idea is we just start with an arbitrary vector bundle in this brain local locus. So we know it is a slow, uh, semi-stable vector bundle on the curve. So it means if you push it forward to the curve, to the K-tree, so I is just embedding of your curve into that K-tree surface, then the push forward of this vector bundle is Giesecker semi-stable. And that's precisely the starting point, which we call it large volume limit. So it just says that a coherent shift E is sigma B and W semi-stable for large uh, for W very large if and only if E is H G secure semi-stable. So this weird... about, uh, is, is the meaning the meaning of large volume limit is that your stability condition is that you're taking that stability condition to take the old fat is that you're taking a certain coherent sheaf or a certain stability condition or what's the meaning of large volume limit? 
And it's just it's there. just because W one of the parameters goes to infinity. I got it. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, you know, you are basically in that region when W is very large. And the claim is that this weird notion of stability in that strange heart is the same as the classical one. So it doesn't really matter that you choose a different heart, but the stability function is constructed in a way that when you put one of the parameters to go to infinity, just force them to be shifts, you know, this stable object to be shifts and the actually desequestering stable. And so, so that's basically the starting point that we know that these objects are Gieseker semi-stable. So this I of SR of F is sigma beyond W semi-stable when W is very large, okay? And that's the point that we just start to understand what causes for that. Our object is stable for W large. And now the question is, what is the, first wall that can happen. So, you know, you know, maybe just I emphasize that I pick, I fix just one, you know, just pick one of these of the vector bundle on the curve C, and then I want to do wall crossing for our fixed, uh, you know, uh, fixed object in, in the X. And the, uh, the first proposition is that it's not that hard to construct, to understand what is the first ball. So, you know, let me just draw the picture again. I'm starting with this large volume limit and just move down along this vertical line and just see what is the first wall that I can actually see for my fixed object. And the claim is that the highest wall wall that can happen uh, for this object of the form of push forward of f for f in our Bernoulli locus is the wall l that um, shifts with mokai vector we are making so i will i will say in a minute what i mean okay and, and your bundle I of S of F gets destabilized <coughs> along this wall if and only if F is of the form of E restricted to C for some bundle E in your moduli space MX of E. And the destabilizing sequence is uh, of this form. E push forward of E restricted to C and <coughs> E twisted by minus H shifted by one. Okay. So the claim is, I know this, you know, look at this sequence, it's just um, the sequence of, you know, when you start with the bundle, you restricted it to the FC and, you know, probably you're familiar with this exact, uh, sequence of coherent shift and I'm just shifted by one. Okay, so you gain an exact triangle, and this is an exact sequence in the hard code B of X in this new Abelian category that you constructed. And the claim is that you, you know, there is a wall that these objects in this moduli space can make, and um, it, this wall only destabilizes objects in this perinomial locus, which are of the form of restriction of this bundle to the curve C. Okay, uh, so it's an if and only if. So it just describes all of the objects that can get destabilized along this wall. And the point is that um, so so uh, in, this basically means you know this destabilizing sequence basically means that. <coughs> Face of E and for any, for any point beyond W on uh, along this wall, we know that face of uh, E is equal to face of um, E twisted by minus H shifted by one. Okay, so and we know that both these two objects are stable, are sigma beyond W stable. It's not hard to show that they are actually both stable. <coughs> 
So your bundle of the form of E restricted to C is just extension of two bond, two stable, two sigma B and W stable of the same phase. That's why I will start with E restricted to C is actually sigma B and W semi state. But the point is when you move a little bit to the top of the wall, then phase of B plus W of E, you know, just increase W a little bit, gets a smaller than phase beyond W plus of E twisted by minus H shifted by one. Okay, so that, that's why we can actually show that this means that I love star of E restricted to C is actually Z B W plus a stable. Okay, and this immediately gives us, since the, it was the highest wall, you are in the large volume limit, E restricted to C, e, you know, stability of that uh, shift in that region just immediately gives that E restricted to C is actually a slope stable. And this just proves the first part that, you know, we have restriction theory. Okay. But I want to just show you that just this, this simple argument gives you immediately that size injective because when you just move a little bit you know, below the wall, you can see that you know, just you know, decrease a little bit W, phase of E gets bigger than phase of <coughs> B twisted by minus H shifted by one. Okay, that's why I will start off E restricted to C is sigma B W minus unstable. And the harder Nyrisma filtration sigma B on W minus HM filtration of uh, is E restricted to C is, is precisely this triangle stuff here, okay? And then, <coughs> so you know that what is a hard and by filtration when you cross the wall, then just uniqueness of HM filtration gives you immediately that this map side, this restriction map side must be injective. So corresponding to any bundle in the image of that map side, there exists a unique bundle E so that this image is, is that fixed E restricted to C. You know? <coughs> this is actually a kind of surprising thing in classical algebraic geometry because you know, no, but as I talked with Arbella Bruno Cernesi, when they wanted to prove this sort of thing, it's 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 quite challenging to prove it using <coughs> classical techniques. But as you see, using wall crossing is just very simple argument that we gain injectivity. So the final part is to gain surjectivity, which is actually the hardest one. <coughs> And that's exactly the point that you need to use the assumption that bundles in this very noetal locus had very high number of sections. Okay, and you show that when you have that high number of sections, then it should come from that restriction. So to explain that idea, I have to quickly say the notion of harden Eisman polygon. <coughs> Let me just quickly mention this notion. So I said that what is the harden Eisman filtration? So for any E in cof B of X, I said, and any point beyond W, any sigma beyond W, <coughs> there exists a unique filtration to semi-stable uh, factors of decreasing the slope. Okay, now I want to look at this filtration in a slightly different way. Look at the, you know, let's just that arrow be just real part of ZBW of E. <coughs> and that want to be imaginary part of ZBW. Okay, I want to start with the first object E1 here. Okay, so this is ZBW of E1. And then I know that if I go to E2, a slope of E2 over E1 is, you know, that phase or it's a slope of that uh, function, a stability function 
is bigger than a slope of E1 over E0. <coughs> That's why if I look at the corresponding point of E2, you see that the slope of this line gets uh, smaller than the slope of that line. <coughs> and so on. So if you continue like that, you will get a, a convex polygon. Each which we call it hard and iris model. <coughs> so the extremal points of the polygon are corresponding to the sub objects that shows up in, in the filtration of the hard and ice band filtration. Okay. And, and so, um, so let me just go to quickly to the final proposition that I want to say, and it's, uh, I call it brain monitor wall. The information said, so if I go back to that picture, I've just described what is the first wall that can happen for bundles uh, on the curve C, for the push forward of the bundles on the curve C. And I've seen that, okay, so the first wall is just precisely the walls, you know, the, the image of the map side. But a priori could have, could be other objects in my brilliant locus, which remains stable after crossing this wall. This wall doesn't do anything to them. So they are stable here, and then I move them. So the you know the usual strategy that we do in wall crossing is that okay, so we understand what are the other possibilities of the walls and see what uh, you know we can show that this cannot happen. But it's it's a very hard problem to actually describe any other walls below L because you just lose control of the destabilizing objects along the lower wall. And so the idea was, instead of looking at further walls, I just jump to this small volume limit when W goes very small. And that's exactly the point that the wall of in the wall that the structure sheaf is making. And that's the point that the information of the section of your object shows up. So unfortunately, I do not have time to just explain why, uh, why this is precisely the point that you see the information of sections. Uh, but you know, I, I can just maybe quickly say the idea behind that proposition. Well, let me just uh, say. Actually, would you, mind, would you mind remind me, what, is, what was the W? Well, uh, I've forgotten the meaning of the W again. Let me just go back probably to that one. For any B, for any vertical line, you have a fixed abelian category called B of X. Mm -hmm. So when you move along that vertical line, your abelian category is fixed. But by uh, choosing dot w, uh, w, the notion of slope function is changing. Great. This function C yeah. would be on the problem. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I'm, I, thanks. Sorry. Yeah, go, yeah, go, you can go back. I, uh, I'm happy to. No worries. Uh, um, so the proposition is that if you just uh, take an object E in, um, in that heart, in, in that vertical line, <coughs> so B of X, where B is equal to zero. Okay, so it's just for simplicity here. <coughs> and uh, the first claim is that when you move down, you are very close to this W small here. Then in that region, the hard and nice filtration of your object is not changing in that very small neighborhood. When W is very small, then the HM filtration of E is a fixed sequence. E, Y, E, N, and so on. Okay, so 
So if you look at this hardened Arisman polygon, you see that you know your objects E1, E2, and so on are fixed. But when you move down, just the fine, you know, this parameter W goes to zero. Okay, that's why I want to just take the limit of this polygon when W goes to uh, zero. So I define PI to be just the limit of this uh, <coughs> CBW of EI where W goes to zero. Okay, so let's just take that limit and um, so that limit so it's just P1 and take that limit to be P2 and uh, it's easy to just uh, show that it's a still a convex polygon. Okay, and the main the main claim is that there exists a norm on a, so there exists a, a norm which up to rescaling the x and y axis is uh, more or less like the Euclidean norm <coughs> such that the number of global section of your fixed object E is smaller than or equal to the Euler characteristic of E over two plus the length of the polygon using that norm. Half of the length of this polygon, PI, PI minus one. Okay. That feels, that, that's, 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 you know, it's unusual to see norms of lengths of the, yeah, that's a neat, that's so yeah, yeah, it's, um, and, and you will see that why it is super useful, uh, that you see it like that. <laughs> okay, so uh, you have such a kind of bound for a number of sections of any object. And now let's just come back to the proposition that uh, I wanted to prove. I want to just uh, show that, so what was the claim? I mean, so the claim was psi is surjective. So assume not, then there exists a vector bundle F, which is not in the image of psi. So F is not restriction of a vector bundle on the cap C. Now I look at the harder Niceman polygon of F, you know, this limit of this polygon when W is very small. Okay, so it's just a polygon like that. This is just its HM polygon. But I know that that and the wall, the, the, you know, this the wall that can happen for my object F are below the wall L that I've described. And so it automatically means that this polygon must be inside the triangle. This is just the triangle that your, your fixed Mokai vector I was just making. It's just VPW of V, the limit when W goes to zero. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's just the, the key point is that the wall for F is below the first wall. That's why the, its, its polygon must be uh, inside that, that triangle. And now what we need to do is just use the definition of the experimental locus. We know that the number of global section of F is bigger than or equal to R plus S. And now I'm going to apply the, you know, so just look at the push forward of that. And I'm going to apply the proposition, this big noetal wall proposition. It says that it's small than chi of I of star of two, plus the length of its polygon, this polygon here, this black one, <coughs> up to n of that length. But I know that this is a convex one. So it must be smaller than the blue one. And it's strictly smaller because I know its wall is below the wall L. That's why its polygon is strictly contained in that triangle. So is strictly smaller than, so let me just call it O, P1, P2. <coughs> But magically, it is precisely our process. And that's the point that you reach your contradiction. That's really sweet. That's nice. Yeah. So, and it just completes the proof that um, size is surjective. And as I explained, 
all of the bundles in the image of Psi are stable, have precisely all possible sections, as, as, as it's like that. And that's why you can describe its, big, uh, its tangent space and show that it's the same uh, is isomorphic to the tangent space of marginalized space of a stable bundle on KT, and we gain an isomorphism. I think that was all that I wanted to say. Thank you.